God, you're making me look shabby. Uh, you know, if you, it's hard to make up for the green pants, you know? <laughs> And we have back between Tiennes with Timothy Hamilton. How are you doing, sir? Yeah, very good. Glad to be here. I've just met you for the first time. Yeah. And I don't know why. I don't either. I've but been how? pretty involved in wife, wife for a while, so... So you've been in the industry a while? Yeah, I have, yeah. All right. And you from what I know, you've worked with the two... It's hard to say the best, but... It is, isn't it? Two very well-known big yacht, uh, motor yacht builders. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The ones that everybody aspires to be with, of, like... Yeah, if you build, for building big yachts, you know, but there's there's fantastic builders that are building, you know, 35 footers or 50 footers that uh, that that fetch up in Lurson yeah. couldn't couldn't touch if they if they wanted to. So, you know, but in the in the big custom yacht building section, uh, they're they're two of the best known names. Yeah, and so you've worked for Fedship and you worked for Lurson. That's right. I'm actually one, I'm the only guy that's ever uh, that ever know, made the switch. That's ever worked for both companies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So how's it going? <laughs> uh, it's good. I mean, uh, both of them are great companies. They have different cultures. Um, Fetchup is a uh, is is you know a, an interesting company because it actually is two separate companies that share a brand. So Fetchup uh, has this uh, sort of interesting dynamic within its own team that there's this always tension there that causes them to always strive towards doing things better and better. Um, Lursen is uh, a German company, Fedship is a Dutch company. Lursen is still family owned um, and has been in business for 140 years or something and has a, a very different corporate culture than Fedship does. So you're, in your opinion, what's, what's the difference? What does a Dutchman stand for and a German stand for? It's hard to, it's pretty hard to put that into, uh, into I, one phrase. I know, I, I can. Yeah? What would you say? The Dutch solve problems, the Germans love problems. Mm. Interesting. I would have said the French love problems. No, they just love the French cause the problem. They just <laughs> <laughs> obviously we know the Germans are. They're no nonsense culture. they right? no. So I was interviewing a guy who sells um, luxury cars, Ferraris, Lamborghinis, and stuff like yeah. that. And he was saying, and he was German himself. Yeah. And he was saying um, how Germans are have are the, obviously have the greatest engineering, one of the greatest engineering cultures on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. But they also have the greatest style and the most fun. And I was like, how on earth, Germans aren't known for that. And he was like, no, 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 no. Because we have order, we're allowed to have the fun. Because we know that the order's always there. The engineering's always there. The fun's always there. So when you have Porsche and um, the other German car manufacturers, they have so much fun and flair because yeah. they know the grounding's good. Yeah. And I never would have thought of the Germans in that way. Well, to support that argument is I have never laughed so hard and had so much fun than I have uh, just hanging out with Lurus and at boat shows. It is hilarious because it's, you would think that it's all, all serious business, but yeah. actually we, even even the guys that have been with Lurison for, you know, 20, 30 years, the, you know, the, the, the guys that are senior guys, uh, you know, we go to dinner and we're often at dinner until 12 in the, one in the morning laughing our heads off. So they know how to have a good time. You're absolutely right. It's amazing. The perception of cultures from an American standpoint is very different to the actual reality. Yeah, I think that's right. I think Where that's are you right. from? I was born in Texas, but I grew up in Florida. Ah, all right. So, so I say I'm a Floridian with Texas blood. That's actually the best way to be. That, that's that's how it is, exactly. Wait, so you grew up in Texas? Yeah. Yeah, on the water or? Actually, I grew up in I grew up in Florida in uh, the Panhandle in Destin, Florida. Uh, oh wow! Which is, okay. Which is a beautiful, beautiful spot, Destin. Anybody that hasn't been there, um, it's uh, they call it the Redneck Riviera, and it's Would fantastic. Would you cl classify yourself as a redneck? You're, yeah, you're I've got a little bit. I got a little redneck underneath, underneath the surface. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> now, why are your customers American-based? Why do Why do Americans go to Germany, Holland, Dutch, the European yards to have a boat built instead of having it done in America? That's a good question because you know I'm also a very patriotic guy, and I would love to see uh, American shipyards build really high-quality yachts. And there is one. You know, there's one or two that do build good boats. Um, but unfortunately, America as a whole, we've lost our uh, we lost our edge on making really good things. I mean, if you think about it, there's no really high-end car manufacturers in the U.S., are there? I mean, there's a couple of boutique car makers here and there, but you know, all the Ferraris and the Lamborghinis and the Rolls Royces and the Bentleys and the you know things like this are all European-made. And the same when it comes to boats. I mean, we have some boat manufacturers in, in the U.S. that are building very reliable, uh, very predictable, usable things that people want. But when it comes to really high-end, custom-made things, 
somehow America has lost a way on that, and I'm not quite sure why that is. The ability's there, and the, and the skill's there. And certainly the market is there. I mean, you would think that uh, between North and South America for large yachts, for, you know, 130, 150 foot plus, something around 30% of all the world's yachts are, are owned by, by, by Americans. But yet, somehow we don't, uh, we don't manufacture that, and, and I just don't know why. I'd love to see it happen. Because America own. has the ability to, I mean, <laughs> make America great again. Yeah. The whole thing that's going, it's been <laughs> part of the uh, culture for the last two, three years. Yeah. It really, you know, back well, in the 50s and 60s, this was. We're putting men on the moon. And even today, we're building rockets, you know, uh, leading the, the world in, when it comes to, to rockets and, and space again, fortunately. And, uh, you know, we're, we're building, uh, you know, technology, you know, leading the world in, in, in those ways. So we definitely have the ability to to innovate and create great things. But when it comes to manufacturing, somehow... So this goes back to maybe the Fed ship and the Lurson mantra. It's family owned. Was it three, four generations of... That's right. Lurson is in their fourth generation right now and the fifth generation is in the is in the company. So... Uh, and so there's that legacy. There's that... That's right. Whereas America doesn't really have that, does it? It's no, I would like say... Build it to sell it. I know some... I know families that... American families that, that uh, are in their... Their, their second, third, or even fourth generation in their in their businesses. So certainly that, that also translates across to our culture. But you're right, there's also a, a lot of people that will build a company and sell it to somebody else. But that happens in Europe. I mean, that happens everywhere. But that's never going to happen to FedShip or Lurson. Well, FedShip actually is. FedShip uh, is two companies. Oh, one of them is Van Lent, and Van Lent is no longer owned by the family. The family's not in the company anymore. What, what's uh, left Van, Van Lent sold, uh, sold to LVMH, which is a, a French conglomerate. Uh, over 10 years yes. ago, the, okay. the DeVries family still owns uh, uh, the DeVries shipyard and they're still very involved and the next generation is is uh, in place. So DeVries is still uh, involved, but half of uh, half of FedShip has is, is, uh, sort of um, moved on. And French. And French, exactly, exactly. Huh. I never made that connection, my God. Yeah. But yeah, that's exactly what happened. But the guys that are now running that, uh, that side, running Van Lent, are very competent individuals. So. Uh, I think they're in good hands and they're building some fantastic yachts. Uh, we got right um, uh, Dick Van Lemp, we know quite well for over the years. Yeah, okay, good. I always remember his tour around his factory. You can eat off the floor. Yeah. He has a cleaner per floor, full time, even on the boats. That's right. Just going around, vacuuming, sweeping, polishing. And it, it, it's not like, it, it is like, um, it's like Google almost in terms of the cleanliness. It's like a computer factory. Yeah. But you're building. Building yachts. Steel. <laughs> and, Dick, and, Dick, and Dick really left a, a strong legacy, and, and you know, Dick is still around, actually, still uh, around the company. But uh, Dick, Dick left a, a strong legacy on, um, uh, on Van Lent, and that he focused heavily on the experience of the client of building the yacht. And he used to say this whenever I first started with yeah. FedShip, is saying, look, people don't just build a yacht because they want the end result. They also build a yacht because they want to enjoy the experience of building a yacht. And I used to say, nah, no, there's no way. A guy's not going to decide, hey, we're going to go to this yard, shipyard because they have a better experience. But and actually, take five years. I've learned over time that he was, he was absolutely right. So having a clean uh, shipyard that is able to deliver for the client a great experience while building the yacht is as important as the product itself. Now, and, uh, that and that's part of the reason for FedShip's uh, success. Counterculture to what Heeson said the other day. So they're making boats to spec. That's right. Um, and because they believe their owners don't want the experience, they want to six months, 12 months, buy in and have the product. You know, it's very interesting because if you, if you look at most of the, of the major shipyards left in the world right now, um, you know, Oceanco, uh, Amos, Hasten, Westport, all these companies have, have gone to a model that primarily builds boats on spec. Right? And actually, those companies have all been very successful at that business model. They build a boat that way, somebody doesn't have to wait three or four years to, to get a boat, uh, but instead, hey, it's, it's available right away. And FedShip and Lurson are two of the last remaining holdouts of the old school method of we're going to wait for a customer to come along, and then we're going to start over and build them a complete custom project from the ground up to their exact wishes. It's a lot harder to do that for multitude of reasons. One is finding somebody that's willing to wait three years or four years. Second of all is, there's a lot more risk inherent with the shipyard of building a fully custom project from the beginning. 
Um, but that thing that makes vegetable noodles kind of special. That must make them special. Yeah. 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 And that's kind of why, you know, they had these reputation you alluded in the beginning. I mean, Amos and Hasten, you know, there's many good builders out there. Um, but yeah. this, uh, this reputation of Fetchup and Lurson of somehow being the best or, you know, the most respected is because every project is special, every project is a one-off. It kind of builds this prestige a little bit, doesn't it? And if you're an owner that owns one, you, you know yeah. you own something unique and, and uh, that nobody else has. And that's why you charge more and that's why... It well, you charge more. It takes a lot more. It takes a lot more effort and uh, a lot more work to build everything one off. When you're able to build the same thing ten or twenty times over, yeah. uh, you're able to significantly special, reduce the cost. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, if you if you went to a car manufacturer and said, hey, "I'd like you to build something completely from the ground up new," you know, it would probably cost you ten times as much as it does, to, you know, the, the normal cost of buying a car. And in a cars and in, in boats, of course, it doesn't cost us ten times as much, but it does cost us a little bit more to build everything as a one off. So. All right, because we never, we always hear that um, shipyards never make money. You know, four percent margin is where everyone is working, and then if there's change orders, you try to absorb those, and then you know, the technology moves on and stuff like that. See, these yards that are you're not necessarily hanging on, but define define their model by doing the spec. You too, you know, the old, you, your old company and the new, and your current one, you are the bastions of what actually the true shipbuilding on that scale is about. If we lose you guys... I don't think that there's any risk right now of, of Lurson or uh, FedShip going anywhere. I mean, both of those, both of the companies have healthy order books. Um, you're right, they don't make very much money, these, these companies. You'd be surprised at the margins. Um, but both of the companies have been around for a long time and have ample reserves. Um, and are, are, both of them are, are being managed by very competent people. So, yeah, um, the best in the industry. Yeah, so I, I think that the, the, the risk of uh, one of those two shipyards... Uh, well, I wouldn't say risk, I mean, if they change their model and try and, try and become more commercial. I know FedShip tried to do the, the series. That's right, yeah. FedShip has done a couple of series, and, and FedShip still uh, will occasionally build a, a boat on spec uh, and, and deliver it, but it's always a one-off spec. Um, so they kind of keep that... That, that customization, you know, there a little bit. Um, Lurson, uh, to this day, has never built a boat on spec, and uh, so far the family has decided that's not a model they want to pursue. Yeah. Um, but I, I wouldn't pass it, put it past to, to being done one day. So the Lurson yard is truly inspirational. I mean, it's, it is Lemwater, isn't it? It's, it's the, the town. It, well, I know you've got Abdeen right next door, but yeah. <laughs> it's, really, it's really you guys. Yeah. And the scale of it, and I mean, I remember seeing the steel plates and the, the hunks of the, the coffer dams, and it's, it, it is on a, an industrial scale that you just can't really comprehend until you've gone there. That's right, and the thing that's interesting about Lurson is, is that, you know, I didn't know Lurson that well before I, uh, before I, I, I started working for them. Um, Lurson is on a whole nother level than any other yacht boat on the planet when it comes to their organizational efficiency. Because it's one thing to be able to build a boat of 1,000 gross tons, maybe even 2,000 gross tons in three, three and a half years. But to build a boat of 16,000 gross tons or 12,000 gross tons in, in three years, and then the next year deliver again another boat of that size, the organizational structure can't just be a little bit better, it has to be multitude better, and it really is. They think and they're organi or organized in a way that makes other yacht builders look like, you know, guys with Lincoln Logs, you know, working with, you know, um, arts and crafts. Um, Lurson, is, Lurson is structured and, and organized in a way like a, you know, like a Mercedes-Benz factory. I mean, it is incredible how well set up they are and, and how sharp they are and how many generations they are ahead of everybody else in, in the way they approach uh, projects and, and building boats. Yeah. Now, can you clear one thing up for me? Yeah. How do you spell Lurson? <laughs> L-U-R-S-S-E-N is, is the brand name, right? But the family name has an E in there. Right. Um, but uh, that is, uh, in, in German, so I've, I've asked this many times because I'm, I'm just starting to learn German a little bit. And actually, in, when it comes to German, having the E in there and not having the E, it seems that it doesn't matter so much, and I'm not quite sure why. Okay. Yeah. So you can do it either way. And you can do it either it's way, and it's both correct, exactly. Because I keep saying, lesson's lesson, but then when you get the E, it's like, lesson? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. So either way. All right, yeah. cool. All right, so when you left the Fed ship, yep. you tried to get out of the industry. That's right. And you were saying it was... How was it different? 
Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that I was particularly running away from the industry. I was trying to build my own company. I, I did a tech startup in real estate. Um, and, uh, t you know, having a, a startup is, is a very hard, stressful thing. I mean, you guys have your own business, so you understand that, that there's good times and there's bad times. And especially in the tech world, because you've got a very short window of... Of opportunity, up, exactly. Yeah. So uh, I, I started my business and very quickly ended up with a lot of competition. And a lot of my competitors raised massive amounts of venture capital very quickly. And I realized very quickly that I was basically getting left behind. So um, I had many, many nights for months and months of just of, of, of stress and, 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 you know, lacking sleep because here I have people to support, you know, I've, I'm uh, investing heavily and, uh, and realizing that I'm getting left behind. So I, I uh, am in the process of exiting that business and, uh, and I got offered to come back into this business. And I, I so feel what, very, you, very fortunate. You applied to the job or they went, hey, we hear you're... Uh it's a bit you, of a story. Actually, we sat, we sat back and we said, uh, my wife and I sat back and said, "Hey, what do we want to do next?" You know, um, you know, I could could go on with tech. I could go work for for one of my competitors in this space, or somewhere else, or I could go work somewhere else in real estate, um, or I could go back into the awning industry. So, what's your speciality? Are you good with tech numbers? Uh, I mean, I, I don't write I don't write pro, uh, code, uh, so that's certainly not it. Um, I don't know what, what my speciality is. That's a very good question, actually. <laughs> You're a good, rounded individual. I guess so. Game. Yeah, just a, I'm just a guy that's a, that's a dreamer. I guess. <laughs> it, it, the Lurson and the Fedship thing. They are. I don't know. We've grown up. I've grown up in this industry since I was like eight years old. Oh really? Yeah. Who was your father in the business or something? Nigel Savage. So, oh yeah. Um, he did a lighting company. Okay. Um, called I didn't Savage know that. Marine Lighting. So you all kind of followed in his footsteps with the lighting thing a little bit. Yeah. So we were in the early days. His business partner was Don Starkey. Really? Um, I didn't know this, man. Yeah. So Don. Starkey. Has anybody interviewed y'all? Have y'all between two yetied each other? No. No. And told your family business. That's Shit. Not yet. Are you guys crazy? <laughs> y'all definitely need to do that. You need to interview each other and kind of interview about your father. Well, what was Tell great your story. about our father? We, we got when I was young, when I was a you know a young teenager, I got to hang out with Don Starkey, Terence Didsdale, Ken Freevok. The legends. Um, um, the legend, the Tim legends. Haywood, all those old school guys. So you know, uh, my my experience of this industry is the Fed ships, the Lursons, right, the right, Eason's, the Atkins right, builds. Right. So when I came to America, it was the perception of those yards did mirror what I what I had seen. But I also have this admiration for America that you know this is the greatest country in the world. Yeah, it really is. Why on earth is it not building better yards? The, and I don't think it's a case necessarily. Of well, I don't know if it is quality or not because I've never owned one, but the abilities there, I just think the, the way that the Germans and the Dutch have marketed themselves in position against the Americans yeah. makes the Americans seem like, well, you, they just throw it together as quick as they can and they pop them out. Well, in a way, though, we're, we're sitting right now across from Westport, right? In a way, those guys are a lot smarter than us because they are building a very reliable, simple, economical to build, very economical to run and own, uh, known entity. It's, it's like a Chevy Corvette. It's yeah. got amazing performance, right? It's, it's a very good price for what it is. It looks great. And, and you it know really what? It gets you, out, it gets you out driving nice. And this Westport right there, for boating, that gets you out boating. And it's, and it's fantastic, you know? It has five cabins or whatever, and uh, it works. It goes to the Bahamas, it goes fast, uh, it's reliable. But it's a stepping stone. It is. It's just not. It's owning. not near as sophisticated as a Bugatti uh, Varon, right? Yeah. You know, uh, it's it's a it's a it just works. So in a way, actually, they're building something that the market really wants. And the reason why that's right is, is they're selling they're selling five or ten of those for every Lurson that's sold, right? So obviously, there's more people that want that than than want a Lurson or are willing to buy that, pay for that, than, than are willing to pay for a Lurson. So I wouldn't say necessarily that. Uh, the, the custom builders that are, that are building these really high-end boats are, uh, are necessarily uh, doing something better. We're, just bu we're doing a better job with building the, the big, very sophisticated, very complex boats. All right, so what, what are you doing now for Fed Larson then? You are uh, so so I'm, I'm going to be setting up an office for Larson uh, here in uh, they Florida. They don't have an office. They haven't had an office since um, early 2000s. They had a guy named Buddy Hack in the late 90s. Yeah. But refocusing our, ourselves back on the 60 meter, 200 foot, 250 footers. Has um, it got too big now then? Yeah, for a while though they did. They really built so many yachts in the 300 foot plus range. Is that serving people's egos? I've got to have something 10 foot, 50 foot bigger than the last Look, one. I, I mean, 
to each their own, right? I mean, if I was building any boat for myself, I'd still probably build an 80 foot, you know, sloop. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, to, to each their own, you know, a, a 300 footer, you can call it helicopter and big tenders and all that, you know, whereas a, a 200 footer, you know, you're a little, a little bit restricted on those, but still, you can still have ample space in a 200 footer, you know, it just is all subjective on, on, on what works for who. It, yeah, because you are serving the egos of the, not even the 1%, it's, it's so your customer base, are they, did they have boats before? Are they coming in brand new, first time, I want something? You would obviously. think that somebody ends up with a 300 footer or even a 200 footer because they've gone through all the steps. And some people do go through all those steps. They first have a, a you know, a Westport 112 or 130 and then they buy a used 50 meter boat and then they build a 60 meter new or something like that. But that, that is, that's, that's more often than not the case, but I would say a good quarter to a third of people just go off and they come in, it's, they've chartered, so they've got a little bit of experience, and the first boat, they just straight up build a, build a Lurson, or they build a, build a fed ship for the first boat, and they'll build a 250 footer or a 200 footer or whatever it is. And it doesn't, it must be, it must be daunting. Or is it just the case I that think that I've, I've anything, got the guy to do it. yeah, you get the right team around you, and, um, you get the right people around you that, that you know are, are looking after your best interests and, yeah. and uh, can advise you correctly. You, you educate yourself like anything else and uh, you build a boat, you build your dream. Oh, yeah. You know, the funny thing is about people that build yachts is most of the time they're entrepreneurs. Um, and so they like building things, you know, like you guys are building a new company or a new service here, but yeah. uh, between two Yetis is pretty cool, you know, you're building something. And so people that like building businesses or building anything else, they like to build build a yacht and build something unique to themselves. It's the challenge in itself. Mm. Putting their own stamp on it. Good God. So, you see, you're, oh, this is a part of the industry I never even considered, but it is. It's giving the best minds in the, in the world. An outlet. An outlet. Mm. To create something. To create something and provide not just the local community, but the entire world a revenue stream. You're absolutely right about that, because I, I used to struggle a little bit with, okay, what am I really doing to help, you know, the world with, with, this, with this career, right? <laughs> but actually, I'm very grateful for our clients that build yachts, because they employ so many thousands. Of, I mean, you guys are indirectly employed by people building yachts. I'm directly employed. We have almost 3,000 employees in Germany that are employed. The guy who made that cap has He has now benefited, exactly. Yeah. And so the, the amount of fallout um, uh, help, you know, this is the sort of trickle-down economics mm. from a guy building a yacht is enormous because normally somebody that builds a yacht, they have ample resources and otherwise they're just sitting in a, an investment account somewhere uh, and they're putting it to real work. Yeah. So I'm very grateful that they do. You're do we'll continue doing the good work you're doing for humanity. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. I'll continue to tribute to humanity. So. And I hope this Palm Beach show has given you what you you would hope. I know we spoke to Theo um, a couple of days ago. Yeah. And he said that you guys are trying to establish which American show you want to kind of like. Yeah. For it to be. Every American that really understands this market, uh, in the large yacht scene at least, loves this boat show. And for, for companies at our end of the industry, we can't do, it's not, it doesn't make sense for us to do two or three boat shows in, in America. We need to really long-term choose one show well, and invest in into Europe, it. You basically do Monaco, Monaco that's and then it. it's just satellite ones. That's right. So Monaco and Fort Lauderdale have historically been the two main boat shows. But because they're so close to each other, they're within a month of each other, it's, it's it, and then you go 10 months without a major boat show. Yeah. And, and additionally, Fort Lauderdale, even though they've moved it back a week, it's still sort of on the tail end of bad weather, so yep. there's that risk. Also, Fort Lauderdale, logistically, from a client experience, is not as nice as Palm Beach. Palm Beach, they could, a client could stay at the Breakers or somewhere else on Palm Beach Island, right? They can valet their car here, no, no headaches, no traffic. You know, uh, they can easily have a nice lunch somewhere in Comatis. Yeah. Um, so the client experience I find in Palm Beach much nicer, and the weather is almost nicer, you know? It's almost perfect. Well, it is yeah. perfect. Yeah. So and Miami I isn't really on the cards, or is it? Miami is an important boat show for the South American market uh, for production yachts, but it's kind of in the middle of the season. So for getting bigger yachts, you know, without yachts, we don't have a yacht show, do we? And when you start to talk about the bigger yachts, it's very challenging to find uh, an owner who is willing to let us put their boat in a boat show. Miami happens to be in February, which is in the middle of the season. 
So it would be unlikely that an owner or less likely that an owner has the boat in town and is willing to say, yeah, sure, you can use it. Whereas this is sort of a perfect time for the client who's towards the tail end of the season, the boats are back from the Caribbean, from the Bahamas. They're preparing in the next few weeks to make the crossing over to the Med to get ready for the uh, Cannes Film Festival, Monaco uh, Grand Prix. Yeah. Um, they haven't quite left yet, but the boats are here in town, so you have a higher chance to be able to get the boats in the boat show, so we can not just have a bunch of guys standing around in booths, but actually have boats to show to our clients. <laughs> it is amazing, the, 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 the thought process for all that and where that's going to end up. Yeah. yeah, so we'll see how it goes, but I, I personally would, would like to see Palm Beach rise over the next five or so years and, uh, and slowly uh, um, draw down from Fort Lauderdale. But in the end, we can only do what we see our clients uh, doing. We follow what the clients do, so uh, we'll only be able to really know uh, uh, over time if the clients start more of them showing up here than in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. Okay, I've got one final question. So, they, a shipyard over there um, was saying that their strength is that they with their shipyard is they bring a lot of outside resources in they don't have an internal team you guys do so they were saying the advantage of that is they get constantly refreshed with new ideas and new innovations and new techniques because they're not keeping it in-house and not you know recycling the same ideas i th i find that interesting so what i what i find very entertaining about about our, our industry is uh, in journalism, in, in the press, oftentimes as a shipyard you release a press release and you put out a message that you want to be, you want to be uh, put in the market and, and you know, uh, uh, the, the, the different news media, whatever things, just, just print that. Um, and if you read a press release, normally someone find, knows what their weaknesses are and then they talk about it with a spin to try to make it as a strength, and that's a precise that's example. <laughs> uh, if, if you, it, it is much more safer as a shipyard to not have employees. To not have employees. Yeah. As a matter of fact, one of the best known big yacht Dutch builders, not Fed Ship, but one of the best known, probably the most expensive big yacht Dutch builder, which is not Fed Ship, by the way, uh, had up to just five years ago only 25 employees, and they were building these 90 meter boats, and they only had 25 employees. So basically, their entire shipyard, everything they were doing was subcontracted. They were really just a general contractor. They said, hey, we have a shed. Okay, you guy in Poland build the hole. You over here paint. You do the engineering. And so there's no control on what's being produced. Wow. The quality is just, I don't know. It could be good. It could be bad. It's probably one boat's good, one boat's bad. One boat has this good, one boat's that good. But the risk is very low because if the market all of a sudden gets really quiet and they don't get an order, no problem. They only have to send 25 employees. Fedship has... 2,000 employees, Lurson has almost 3,000 employees, and so there's a lot of risk with that, right? If the market is slow, those are all mouths that we have to continue to feed, right? Yeah. But what we have is, is we have all these employees that, uh, we, that are uh, within our control to maintain quality and continue to improve, and as we improve our organizational structure, most of those guys have been working for us for 20 years plus, they get better with each one. And when it comes to R&D is what they're discussing there, we actually have dedicated teams that do R&D, both on the engineering front, uh, on, on supplies, on new materials, uh, that are constantly feeding the machine. But this longevity of, of the same guy doing the job every time, he's able to go and speak to the crew on the last one and said, hey, did that work? Oh, that worked good. Oh, but we can make it better by doing it this way. Okay, fine. And so that knowledge continues to build over time. And, and that's why Fetchup and Lurson is building the best yachts, um, yeah. because they, they have those in-house work. As a supplier, it, it, it's evident when you work with um, a boat company that it doesn't matter what nationality, and they're only producing one boat every three years, the purchase order comes in, you know, like, you guys, it's a, it's a process. Yeah. It's NDAs, it's purchase agreements, it's t TNCs. That's it's just experience. Confidentiality agreements. Yeah. You're talking 50 pages worth of just documentation before you even get the request for quotation. Yeah, that might also be the German overdoing things as well. <laughs> it's, well, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, but it, it, that 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 level of professionalism sets you as a supplier as I've really got to perform. Yeah. And if I don't, the consequences are term number 25, 26, 27, 28. Yeah. So it's it, it, it. You guys bring your suppliers up to a level which perhaps the rest of the industry doesn't necessarily require. And also what happens is that ends up benefiting uh, others, right? So Fedship and Lurson, you know, we are constantly pushing interior uh, manufacturers, uh, uh, engine manufacturers, 
you, you know, for instance, we developed together with Hug, which is a uh, an exhaust particle cleaner for, for, for many engine exhaust, to be tier three to consolidate some of the different machinery needed uh, for, for exhaust, right? We work together with them to develop that, but all of our competitors are now going to benefit from that uh, from that new uh, um, engineering development. Wow. Give them back, you see? It's all about... It's well, all about we don't want to, but it's just that's oh, the it's nature just of the business. Yeah. <laughs> Dear. So. Oh, and last thing. Lurson party at Fort Lauderdale. It's pretty you awesome. You don't do it for... You don't, uh, you don't do it to get a customer. No. You do it just to show that the Lurson boys can have fun. I think it's in the DNA of Lurson that we talked about in the very beginning that I'm only now discovering is that Lurson to me always seemed from the outside as these very serious German guys. And they are very serious, don't get me wrong. But they really like to have a good time. And that is part of the experience that we were talking about with Dick Van Lent is um, the experience of building a yacht should be fun for the owner and it should be fun for everybody. And if, if we're not all having fun, if we're taking ourselves too seriously, then I think we're doing this wrong. So. Well, thank you for leading the industry. Yeah. Hey, that's uh, just part of it. Yeah. Well, you're the American face of it now. Yeah. <laughs>